Well, church family, we're going to continue worshiping by reading God's Word together. And so if you have a Bible, a copy of the Scriptures personally, I want to encourage you to turn and join me in Luke chapter 24. Uh, if you're watching online with us, maybe you don't use a hardback Bible. I do, so I'm not distracted by text or alerts. Um, you can use the U version, Y-O-U, U version Bible app. Um, you can set up a Bible reading plan. Just however you read, read with us so that you can feast on God's Word the other six days of the week. And we were in Luke chapter 24 last week. We're going to be in that again this week. It's a rather long chapter, and there's a lot of God's truth to mine, the nuggets of God's wisdom out of this passage. And you know, um, when I gave Amy her engagement ring, one of the things I did, I surprised her with it. And so obviously, like when I got it, um, I just couldn't sleep at night. And I would look, I would turn on my bedside light when I couldn't sleep, and I'd hold it up to the light to be like, man, that looks really good. And then I would like turn it off and go to bed. And like when I'd wake up in the morning, I'd brush my teeth and be like, I want to see what it looks like in the sun light, right? Like, yeah, that is good. Like clarity, clear, all the C's, right? All that good stuff. And um, w- one thing that's interesting is that's, that's the way scripture is. Like you can read the same passage and you just hold it up to the wisdom of God. And sometimes you see something beautiful in a different way you didn't see the week before. So I want us to enjoy, I want us to just be fully satisfied, fully content, and just in awe of what God teaches us from this word. And one of the things, let me set this text up. Last week we, we saw in Luke 24 uh, that on Resurrection Sunday, the first Sunday that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, it, it literally happened. Jesus died for sins on Good Friday, your sin, my sin, the sin of everyone that's ever lived, past, present, or future. And on Sunday, that first Easter Sunday, God raised him from the dead. The Bible says in Luke 24, he appeared in the area of Jerusalem, leaving Jerusalem. There were a couple of disciples, a guy named Cleopas and another disciple that we don't really have the name of. Some people think it was Cleopas' wife. Some people think it was another guy walking with him. The point is, Jesus appears walking along the road next to them, the resurrected Jesus. But he prohibited them from knowing that it was him. For his purposes, he didn't want them to know. And so he walks up alongside of them and he says, what are you guys talking about? Because they were in a debate, a discussion, and they were talking about what they had seen and the crucifixion of Jesus and women had gone to the tomb and they're saying uh, he's not there anymore. And so Jesus shows up and he just asks a lot of really good questions and then he listens to what they have to say. Now, last week I emphasized how important it is for us as followers of Jesus to ask really good questions and be really good listeners And we talk about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. And if we want to see people come to faith in Jesus, asking really good questions and being really good listeners is critically important. So this past week, your pastor would not ask you to do something I'm not willing to do. So in every conversation I was in this week, I tried. I wasn't always successful, but I tried to ask the questions first and then to ask as many questions as I could as follow-ups to listen well to the story of others. So important for us. You know, but at some point when we're talking about gospel conversations, we will get the opportunity to speak. We'll earn the right. We'll get the opportunity to speak. And when we do, we not only want to share how God has been faithful to us, but we want to be faithful to share Scripture because Scripture alone has the power to save people and to put them in a right relationship with God. I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to see how important Scripture is in your life and our conversations with others. So would you stand with me in honor of God's Word? And in Luke chapter 24, after Jesus asked these men what they had been discussing, and they say that Jesus had died and the tomb is empty and they're discouraged, look at what it says in verse 25. Jesus said to them, how foolish and slow you are to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah, the promised one, to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets... Jesus interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. So let's just spend time focusing and feasting on those three verses today. The men shared that they were disappointed that Jesus had died and that the tomb was empty. And they were down and discouraged. And he said, how foolish and slow you are to believe all that you have already been told. Wasn't it necessary for the one you've been waiting on to suffer and to die in order to enter into his glory. Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in Scripture. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I am so um, guilty of 
reading and thinking is pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Scripture is important. What, what do you got for me next? What do I need to learn? Show me something fascinating. God, we're sometimes impatient. We're sometimes complacent. We're sometimes lazy. And we do not know your word in the way we should. Your gentle rebuke to these men is if they had known their Bible, they would have known you'd already arrived. And so, Lord, I pray that you would give your congregation, you would give your church, you would give Christians, not only in Middle Tennessee and the nation and around the globe, a hunger for your word. Lord, not out of duty and obligation. If there's somebody in the room that thinks that reading scripture and knowing scripture and being equipped with scripture is something that's drudgery, Lord Jesus, show them that that is not your heart. Show them that your words and the word of scripture has the ability to bring people from death to life. And we thank you that you reveal that to us in this text and that your word is living and active and just as important in 2021 as it was when you spoke and when your follower Luke recorded this. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. Well, as I mentioned, these men, these two disciples, in the general sense, they weren't full-on committed followers of Jesus, but they were expressing their discouragement that this promised one, Jesus, who said he was the one they'd been waiting on, had been crucified, died, and now the tomb was empty. And so in verse 27, then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he began to interpret for them the things concerning himself and all the scripture. And one of the first things I want you to know is what Jesus does with these men is he affirmed the validity of the truthfulness and the trustworthiness of the Old Testament. Jesus affirmed the truthfulness, the trustworthiness, and the validity of the Old Testament. Now, that may not seem like a big deal to you. It may not seem super important, but it's incredibly important, as it was for them, for us. Listen, before Jesus arrived, it had been 400 years since we read in our Bible from the prophet Malachi. It had been four centuries since God had spoken to his people. So at the time Jesus arrives on this road from Jerusalem to this town called Emmaus, the only scripture that God's people had to that point was Genesis through Malachi, from Genesis, from Moses, or the law, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, all the way through the prophets, the major prophets, the minor prophets. They had scripture, but it was what we would call the Old Testament. Now, you and I call it the Old Testament because we live on this side of the cross. We have the Old Testament or the Old Covenant. Listen, Jesus uh, the Father, God the Father established a covenant with his people in the Old Testament of a way for them to stay in right relationship with him. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. They were created for good. They were broken by sin. And I, I use that word loosely because sometimes we can minimize the effects of sin. They were broken by sin. They were damaged by sin. Sin leads to death. They ultimately physically died. Their relationship with God began to die. They became distanced from him. They felt shame and guilt from being around him. They found complications in their relationship with other, like their relationship with God and with one another was severed. And so God did not quit loving them. That's one of the best things about many of the stories in the Old Testament. Even when you run from God, he doesn't quit loving you. I think Jonah is one of the best stories in the Bible. And I met someone not too long ago that said, I really have trouble believing that this man ran from God and that like he was on a boat and they threw him overboard and a fish swallowed him and that the stomach acid didn't completely consume this guy and the fish. And it was just very refreshing to have an honest conversation uh, with someone who approached scripture from a skeptical perspective. Some of us have grown up in church, others of us have not. And so it was very refreshing to discuss this. But even through all of the scripture, even through all of the stories, God did not quit loving Jonah. God did not quit loving Adam and Eve. And so he established a covenant through Abraham and on down through Moses. He said, the way you'll stay in a right relationship with me is through obeying the rules and the law that I give you. The law, the Torah, that's how you stay in a right relationship with me. Rules and law. And so that's the old covenant. Now, a lot of times we don't read the Old Testament. I, I don't know if that's challenging or convicting or maybe it's just acknowledging what we all know. We don't read the Old Testament a lot because we don't understand a lot of the Old Testament. If it is about God and his people, the Hebrews, the Jews, and we didn't grow up Jewish or you're not Jewish or you didn't grow up in first century Galilee, um, you may be confused by some of the customs and the traditions of his people and his relationships with him. It's often been said that many a New Year's resolution to read the Bible through in a year gets shipwrecked on the shoals of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. I mean, we, right? Like, 
It's hard. It's like eating oatmeal. It just multiplies in your mouth, and it's hard to digest. And maybe that's why we don't read the Old Testament, okay? Now, listen, some Christians assume that the good stuff of Scripture happens when Jesus shows up. Like it happens when Jesus shows up in the New Testament. Like all that, eh, the prologue, is, you know, the, the past is important. But like when Jesus shows up, and there are red letter Christians, there are individuals who say what's most important are the red letter words of Jesus. Because when he shows up, that's when it gets good. And, and sometimes those stories are more fascinating. And sometimes the New Testament is easier to read. I'll give you that. But one of the things that I want you to know is that Scripture, the full complement of Scripture, has been inspired by God. And the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. And every story in the Old Testament whispers the name of Jesus. Every story in the Old Testament whispers the name of Jesus. Listen to me, y'all. Like, you can read just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You can read, you know, the pastoral epistles. You can read James. You can read stuff for practical living. But you can't fully appreciate the New Testament if you do not understand the Old Testament. Did you hear what I said three minutes ago? The Old Testament, the Old Covenant was you remain in right relationship with me by obeying my rules and my law. And if you sin, something's got to die for your sin. So they would go to the priest, and the priest would sacrifice an animal, and the shed blood of the animal on the cross, whew, okay, I don't have to die for my sin. And the, and the priest would say, you are forgiven because this sacrifice has atoned for you. Like, my goodness, there were so many hundreds of rules and laws and restrictions. Like, nobody's good enough to live up to that standard, Right? And that was one of the points of the Old Testament, to make us aware that none of us are perfect. None of us are good like God. And when you feel the weight and the overwhelming sense of your sin and your brokenness, and I can't measure up. I mean, I have trouble keeping the commands of my parents. I have trouble keeping the commands of my teacher. I have trouble following through with what I promised my coach. Like, right? How many of us feel that way? When you realize the weight and the overwhelming sensation, the burden of the law, well, that's why God sent Jesus Christ. That's why we call it a new covenant or the New Testament because when Jesus came, he said, look, the way from now on to stay in a proper relationship with my Father is not through rules, but it's through relationship with me. And if I'm the gateway, if I'm the key to relationship with my Father, if you believe in my finished work on the cross and the power of my resurrection and you profess your faith and believe in me, you'll be united not through your works, not through your morality, not through your religiosity, not through your good social work. Like You will be redeemed and restored in a right relationship with God through grace. Grace, unearned, unmerited favor. The Old Testament, Old Testament went from rules and religion to relationship in the New Testament. Church, that is good news for us. The Old Testament whispers the name of Jesus. One of the, um, one of the resources we used to use in our home, we don't use it so much anymore because the kids are older, is the Jesus Storybook Bible. I see parents amen and nodding in here. Like, this thing is a treasure, right? The Jesus Storybook Bible. And, and one of the things that Sally Lloyd-Jones says is the Jesus Storybook Bible. Listen, if you're an aunt or an uncle, this is a great gift to give to your niece or your nephew or your neighbor. Somebody puts a big bow on the mailbox or the townhome or the apartment. Say, hey, congratulations. Like, here you go. Like, this is a great way to spend your earthly treasures to be rich towards the things of God. And it says every story whispers his name. And one of my favorites is what I mentioned just a moment ago, the story of Jonah. And it's it's right here. It says, after three days, the fish spat Jonah safely out onto a sandy beach. Just then, Jonah heard someone calling his name. Go to Nineveh and do what I told you to do. Preach to these people. And this time, Jonah said yes. And he went straight to Nineveh and told everyone God's wonderful message. Even though you've run far from God, he can't stop loving you, Jonah said. Run to God so that he can forgive your sin. The people of Nineveh listened to Jonah, and they started loving God, and they learned to do what God said and to stop running away from him, just like Jonah. You know, many years later, God was going to send another messenger, kind of like Jonah, with the same wonderful message of repentance and belief in God. Like Jonah, this messenger would spend three days in utter darkness, but this messenger would be different. He would be God's own son, and he would be called the Word because he himself would be God's message. God's message translated into our own language. Everything God ever wanted to say to our whole world. And a person. And his name is Jesus. 
Man, I love how Sally Lloyd-Jones describes that and shares that. Like every, like if you look at the story of Joseph being sold into slavery and then, you know, redeeming his brothers and it wasn't his fault. He didn't do anything wrong. He was mistreated. He was abused. And yet he is generous and gracious towards them. Like every story in the Old Testament, we could go on and on. Esther and Ruth and Naomi and all these great stories. We're going to be in Ruth during the month of May. I'm phenomenally excited about four weeks of being in the book of Ruth. Spoiler alert, if you want to go ahead and read, go ahead now. Like there's no like failure or there's no problem there if you just want to go ahead and read the book of Ruth, but every one of these stories points towards the coming of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus shows up, he says, listen, I mean, he started with the law and the prophets. Now, most likely he didn't share every verse and every passage. Like that would be a really long conversation. I don't think that's what's implied in the text. That is my belief. He most likely didn't explain all of it, but he explained enough where they would see You have to understand how God has worked in this entire narrative of Scripture to bring you to a point where you can repent of your sin, you can be brought into a relationship with God through your faith in Jesus, and now, on this side of salvation, in obedience, you can walk with God to join Him in partnership as God is changing hearts and redeeming cities and restoring communities like that's what we get to do on this side of salvation. We get to dust for God's fingerprints in our community. Where are you at work? And where can I join you in that? And a lot of time it's, it's your spiritual gifts. It's your passions or your past experiences, sometimes difficult past experiences that have been redeemed that give you a heart for like, this is who I want to help. This is who I want to work with. This, in Jesus' name, is who I want to join him in mission for. Now, I want to share something with you like on the screen here in just a second. I mentioned that Jesus most likely did not share everything from Scripture, but enough to show them, I had to die to bring you the kingdom that God wants. So I want to show you, these are four words. These are four words, and I'm going to ask Brent if he'd put this up on the screen for me, that I think are super helpful. These words are God, man, Jesus, response. Get your phone out and take a picture. Jot it down. That's totally okay. Like, God, man, Jesus, response. There's a natural progression when you share the good news of Jesus with others. Jesus shared enough so that they would understand you were created for good. God created you for good, and God created people that were perfect, and everything was right. But then man sinned. Man brought sin and death into the world. But even though man messed up, God didn't quit loving them, so he kept pursuing them. And the whole Old Testament tells that there's one coming to do for you what you can't do for yourself, and his name is Jesus. And when you respond in faith and belief, repentance of sin, that means to turn from your sin and to turn towards Jesus and to invite him into your life, to ask him into your heart. I once asked a child, do you want to ask Jesus into your heart? And they're like, I don't even know how that works. Like, how can he fit all up in here? Like, what does that look like? Like, whatever phrase you want to use, repent and believe, then your response seals, it guarantees your relationship with Jesus in the life to come in a literal place called heaven. But you don't have to wait to tap in on the goodness of Jesus. You join him in mission now. God, man, Jesus responds. Now, why is this important? Because what I have found is sometimes when we're really good listeners and we build relationships with people and they give us a doorway into their lives, at some point, I've mentioned this last week, and I'm going to emphasize it all three weeks of this Gospel Conversation series, You and I have to be faithful to share Scripture with others. Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes from hearing the Word of God. Faith comes from hearing the Word of God. There's enough power in the Word of God to bring people spiritually from death to life. My father-in-law is a Gideon. I don't know if you've ever been to a Gideon's banquet where they celebrate God's faithfulness through their ministry. Has anybody ever read a Gideon's Bible in, in your nightstand in the hotel room? You may have opened it up and been looking for something. You're like, oh, there's this Gideon's Bible in here, and you close it, and you may not think much of it. If you go to a Gideon's banquet, no matter what city, what state, they will share stories of where someone emailed them and said, I was down and out. I was thinking about taking my life. I was thinking about running away from my family. I was on a business trip, and I was tempted with some sort of pleasure that I was going to pursue. And I opened up, and I found this scripture, and I started reading. And this Bible convicted me. It challenged me. It brought me... It brought me to a place where I was ready to surrender my life and trust Jesus. I mean, like the power of God's word. It's living and active, as the author of Hebrews says. He has the ability, Scripture alone, to save people. And Scripture alone has the power to build and establish a healthy, growing church. That's why we stand in honor of God's word. That's why we ask in our life groups, Bible reading groups, mentor relationships, we don't use a whole lot of curriculum written by good, godly men and women, and there's great stuff out there. We use Scripture as our primary text. 
He said to them, how foolish and slow. If you knew your Bible, you would have known the Messiah would suffer, be crucified, and died. It is a rebuke that you did not know your own word. Now, here's what I see when Christians don't know their word. If you do not know the word, now this isn't guilt or obligation, okay? So you can interpret it a number of ways. Jesus would preach a parable and he'd say, he who has ears, let him hear. There's some woman or man in this room that you're tracking with me. It has nothing to do with me. It's the Holy Spirit. But I'm going to pray that you listen to this not out of guilt or obligation, but when you don't know the word, I pray that you'll listen to this out of growth and humility. When you don't know the word, you can be misled. You can be lied to, hook, line, and sinker, and by all of it thinking you're doing something very good and very helpful. Listen, do not think with your eyes. Do not base your life on what you hear. The guiding principle for followers of Jesus is what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. Hear me, there are no errors in Scripture. The doctrinal word for that is inerrant. There's no errors in Scripture. It doesn't contradict itself. It has the power to bring eternal life. I hear a lot of people say about things, well, the way of Jesus is compassion. The way of, I hear a lot of things covered with a veneer of the way of Jesus is. We can say the way of Jesus, like my grandfather died of Alzheimer's. There's nothing in Scripture about, I mean, there's nothing in Scripture about end-of-life care for an Alzheimer's patient. There's nothing. But the way of Jesus is compassion, is dignity. Absolutely the way of Jesus. We can say that about certain things. You can say the way of Jesus about, like, should we send our kids to public school, private school, home school? Like, well, the way of Jesus is love, you know, God with your heart and your mind, and he, he, he believes in education. And, like, the way of Jesus would be to surround yourself with wisdom. There's a lot of things that we can say the way of Jesus about. But sometimes I hear people say, but the way of Jesus is compassion about things he's clearly spoken about. You know, what does Scripture say? One of the most interesting things that I saw this week when I was going back through here 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all Scripture is God-breathed. Even when Jesus was asked, he was asked by a group of religious leaders, is it lawful for people, husbands, to divorce their wives for any reason? And Jesus said, haven't you read? Haven't you read what your Bible tells you? Jesus is affirming what his Father said. That's why we affirm what Jesus said. That's why we affirm what Scripture said. We don't think and feel with our eyes or, our, or what we or our emotions. But Jesus literally said, haven't you read that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female? For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So whether we're talking about marriage, whether we're talking about healthy sexuality, we talked about the building blocks for marriage. It's coming up next month. Everything we do and believe, like how should we live? How should we engage relationships? How should we behave sexually in a healthy and God-honoring manner? Like we don't do what we see in culture or alone or what we hear from someone who's well-intended. We go back to Scripture because if you don't know your Scripture, you can be misled. You can be lied to. You can, at a minimum, get scared and fearful and overwhelmed with anxiety and fear because we don't trust. Like God is consistently faithful in Scripture. And there's sometimes in my life where I don't know how things are going to play out. But I know that throughout Scripture, God has been faithful. He's proven it time and time again. He'll be faithful again. I know the Bible's promises that God will be faithful even when we are not. At a minimum, if you don't know your word, you won't trust when everything else around you is swirling and turned upside down. Jesus explained to them how important it was for them to know the word and for them to be ready to share the word. And I'll, I'll share this with you. One of the things that I am doing in my own relationships with the people in my neighborhood, beautiful, creative, talented people, as I share scripture, I want to arm myself with scripture. Like our thoughts and opinions are important, but scripture, as we've clearly discovered, has the ability to save people and redeem and restore relationships in a way that good effort and Striving on our own can't. And so one of the things that I'm doing when I have a gospel conversation with someone is, is I use this. Brent, will you throw up for me that progression in a conversation? And you can take a picture of this. But I try to take it like first from superficial to meaningful. Right? I've heard it said sometimes we talk about the weather because we don't have any substance of anything else to talk about. Like, okay, like I think it's nice outside today. Like, right? Okay, so like no judgment, Okay. Like, but sometimes we tell, like, how you doing? What's going on? Are you having a good weekend? And that's fine, like, when we can't really get into long discussions. But 
I try to take it from superficial to meaningful. So I'm talking about the weather with my neighbor. I try to take it to something meaningful. What are you, what are you getting into this weekend? Since it is good weather, what are you getting into? And, you know, you may have a conversation where your neighbor says, well, um, I, we're going we're gonna to spend time with our daughter because she had a really tough week at school, and the teacher sent home a note, and she's just struggling with her identity, and she wants people to love her so much in, in her classroom, and she's trying too hard, and she just thinks that nobody likes her. And so, oh, okay. Well, you know what? Um, I try to take it from meaningful to spiritual. I'm looking for the way to bring Scripture into it because, as we talked about, listening is good, but bringing God's Word into it. So I say, well, can I, can I share with you like one of the things that we've learned that Jesus has taught us in, in trying to walk alongside our daughter and something like that? I've never been turned down when you ask that and be like, can I just share a story from our own life maybe with you? And so you might talk about how God is faithfully reminding your daughter or our daughter her identity and her worth is not in whether or not people like her in her classroom. I don't care if you're nine like my daughter or 99 or 39. We all want people to like us. And I think every sermon could go back to identity if we understood our identity, right? We'd be more confident. We wouldn't look for someone else to give us our worth which is you were created by God to find it in him through Christ Jesus. So I might explain that spiritually, and from spiritually I would eventually work my way into the gospel to share with them God, man, Jesus' response with them so that they can understand. We don't know it all, and, and our daughter doesn't know it all, but we have been saved by Jesus. We're broken. We have found in him something we couldn't find on our own, and now we're in partnership with him. Our family is growing with him like we would explain this. Now, listen, just so you know, I'm a pastor. Like, I don't pull out my phone and show them pictures and charts, right, of this stuff in my yard or in my neighborhood, right? I don't do this, okay? But do, do you see what we're talking about? That Jesus modeled for us a gospel conversation where, for us, we, we need to communicate enough of the Scripture where people get the understanding that we're broken, we need him. Only he can save us from our sin, and now we can have purpose and life with him. And more than our thoughts and our opinions and our feelings, we should stick with what Scripture says about everything, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say should be a question you ask yourself when you're giving counsel, when you're thinking about a decision with work, right? But then ultimately, when we own our faith enough to be confident to share it with others, we want to get to a point where it moves from surface and superficial to sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. I mentioned this yesterday. Um, I mentioned this last week. We've got a gospel conversation board in the commons area. If you share the gospel at any point the other six days when we're not gathered, grab one of those little yellow push pins out there and put it on the board wherever you are. Somebody commented to me this weekend, my goodness, somebody's killing it in Bon Aqua. And I'm like, I don't even, I, I don't, I don't even know where that is. And they're like, it's like out 40, like, you know, kind of towards Dixon and out that way. And I do, you know, I thought every time there's bad weather or inclement weather, it always seems like the lady on TV says, Bon Aqua, get down in your basement. So I have heard it before, I, right? You'll, you'll see it the next time it happens, okay? But like, people are sharing Jesus, and they're putting a yellow pen out there not, not to show results. That's not a gospel results board. It shows our obedience, because we never want to turn our friends, neighbors, and coworkers into a target for conversion. It's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to say, I know what my life looks like without Jesus. That's why I want you to know him. And I want you to have hope in him. So if you've had one of those conversations at any point, grab one of those pens, put it up there on the board, because that will encourage us, and we'll celebrate that together. And by the way, all of this stuff that we're talking about, we're, we're going to share that this week. We're going to dig into it at a deeper level. Starting tonight, we've got gospel conversation equipping here in the church. Got it tonight. Now, show up tonight at 6 o'clock. We'll have it here. We would love to see you. Our life group leaders, our Bible reading group leaders, our mentor relationship leaders are all going to try to lead every one of our groups in the church through that this week. Pray for us. I've been praying that we'd have 120 members in our church be equipped with the gospel and how to share the gospel by the end of the year. If you feel intimidated, if you feel overwhelmed, if you're like, oh, my gosh, easy for staff members, but, like, that ain't my thing. That's totally cool. It's fine. But we want to give you the confidence and we want to equip you with the joy of sharing your faith. So you can show up tonight, you can show up Tuesday night, you can show up Wednesday night. We're doing it three nights this week. We would love to see you here. And I'm not under any illusion that if you equip somebody to share their faith, they're out there obediently doing it. How many of us have gone to a training or an equipping at work and we're like, I don't even remember what I just learned, right? That's life. It happens. So we're going to be doing this a lot until Jesus returns. But it, it's a good start. you got to start somewhere learning how to share your faith, learning how to be a good listener, learning how to be compassionate, because ultimately it's the gospel that can save people and give them eternal life. Isn't that why we're here? Isn't that why this church exists and lease this space on this street in this community that we love? Yeah, that's why we're here. And that's why Jesus wants us to be emulating of what he's modeled for us in this text. So let me encourage you to bow your head and close your eyes for just a minute, because I, I think it would be helpful for all of us to consider... 
how to apply this text in our lives, okay? 